So welcome everyone. Uh, here we are in person again. So we are super happy to to see you in person. And also we're happy that so many of you joined uh, over Zoom. I will try to be super short because we will have uh, four people on stage today. So as you know, this is a meetup organized by the Vienna Data Science Group. And I'm not the best person to pitch the Vienna Data Science Group for you, but I will still do my best. So we are a non-profit organization for uh, getting people together and organizing events and any other activities that help you advance your career or you know, to talk with each other and uh, to build a community in data science. If you want to join the data science group, you can donate 50 euros and then you're in. That means you have a vdrg.at address and you have access to our internal Slack channels. If you'd like to join, there are several ways. Uh, you can either reach out to any of you. May I ask you to raise a hand if you are a Vienna Data Science Group organizer? Yeah, Peter there, Murray there, for example, Gero there, yeah, and, and here I am again. And there are, you know, several platforms you can use. We are quite active on LinkedIn. Um, so all of, all of our announcements uh, go there but you should be able to uh, go and send an email or use Twitter or any of the, uh, you know, the usual suspects of uh, media. We'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors. So we have a few resident sponsors, Context Flow, which is an um, Austrian deep learning company in the healthcare industry, and Freedom Data, Gradient Zero, Informance, and Unisoft Plus. So thanks for sponsoring us folks, uh, this way we can pay for our server costs. Also today we have two other sponsors. The place is, as you might guess, is made available by Magenta and we have uh, Caldera who took care of the food and drink. So thanks a lot. This is how we can keep going. Okay, so with that, just a little bit of housekeeping and, um, and um, I'll let you, let you listen to the talks. So I'm Zoltan, by the way, one of the organizers. And um, let's see. This event is recorded and will be put on YouTube. Uh, we don't record your faces. Don't worry about that, unless you are in the front of that camera. But if you ask questions, we might record your voice. And let's see. I saw that uh, I would be able to start recording. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so recording starting now. About the facilities, you've already seen where you can grab uh, some snacks and drinks. We are going to have uh, more serious catering after the event. So after the event, you can just go out and have a chat and have some food. If you want to visit the restrooms, they are not, not the first on the left, but on the second on the left, right as you as you walk out. Uh, yeah, two other service announcements. One is that uh, as we are growing, so now you are quite a few people, I would say like 75 to 80, uh, we ran into challenges finding companies who can provide a place uh, such big. So if you work for a corporation or a university or anyone who has a room that can host at least 80 people, and can uh, host us regularly or once in a year or at any schedule, please uh, send us an email or just come to me or Murray or to any of the organizers and uh, let's get rolling. Of course, as an exchange, we are happy to you know, have you on stage and, and if you want to hire, then, uh, then have your message go through to the community. Also, we are running for co-organizers for the meetup. So there are a few people from the organizer team who are, uh, who are active. But if you want to help with uh, marketing or emailing of, uh, with speakers or looking for facilities or anything like that, we are happy to take any help. So again, just talk with us. Thank you. So I believe that's very much it. And then our first talk today is uh, from a sponsor, Cloudera, and from Florian from Cloudera. So Florian. 
Yeah. So we're going to uh, switch to Florian's laptop. So if you join Zoom, probably yeah. that's the best. I'm already there. You're ready there. So just a minute. Thank you very much. Um, so it's good to see so many faces here. Uh, my name is Norman Turk, and I'm a solutions architect at Cloudera. And uh, today I would like to show a little bit of what we do um, in five minutes, hopefully. Um, so basically what Cloudera does is it provides a, a data platform which helps you to maintain control over your full data cycle, uh, life cycle. Uh, and what I mean with that is you control everything from starting from collecting the data, so interest in the data, to transforming and enriching the data, then um, having one unified layer for reporting, uh, also providing some interface for applications, and of course also we provide tools for the data scientists to apply machine learning and develop models. Um, what's maybe even more important for an enterprise setting is that all of this is basically overlaid with um, a shared data experience. So um, what I mean is you have one layer of permissioning and uh, one view of the data lineage. So you see exactly how the data moves and who has access to which objects. Um, and how we do this is that uh, we basically put together um, the best of the open source projects uh, and form with this the Cloudera platform. So you see that um, there's Kafka, there's Spark, there's Hive. Um, so all the names that uh, are floating around in the community and we put them together and allow you to manage them uh, with one single plane basically. Um, so, those of you who might know Cloudera, and I think a few of you uh, here do, um, so this is usually what people know of Cloudera, right? Uh, sorry. And if you cannot hear me, please just raise your hand. Is, is it better now? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is what people usually associate with uh, Cloudera, right? You have the on-premise world, and you have uh, the bare metal which is standing there, and just, uh, you know, probably being uh, idle for some time. Um, and this is what uh, people know when they think about uh, Cloudera most of the time. So, but uh, what happened is actually that uh, now and recently uh, we've moved towards a more hybrid uh, approach. So uh, right now you're able to deploy everything in the cloud as well. And by that I mean not only like as an infrastructure as a service, so just putting basically uh, all the CP platform on digital machines with, by which you can you know, more dynamically scale up and down um, compared to bare metal, of course. Um, but it goes further, right? So we have now also the platform as a service. So we can have data services uh, which run um, fully dockerized, which really adaptively scale to your needs. Um, and without spoiling too much, um, you actually also uh, will have the chance to go for something uh, more software as a service um, in the near future. So basically, um, this is CDP1. Um, and we come to that uh, in the end again, but which is like one click away from the full uh, beta platform. And um, this is probably the most exciting thing at the moment. So I will try to show you very quickly how the CDP as a platform as a service currently looks like. Um, so you have a single control plane in the cloud. You have here the data services and those auxiliary services that help you to manage the data and the access and everything. Um, if you go deeper, you see that you have uh, different environments. For instance, uh, we have one for today. Um, and the environment would be something, but uh, 
showed you before. So basically just having um, this shared data experience, right? So for those who are familiar with um, Atlas and Ranger, it also be for data lineage and for transitioning. Um, and on top of this, you can then decide to you know, create a data hub, for instance. The data hub would be like the first uh, infrastructure as a service um, CDP offer, basically. So you have there uh, a virtualized machine environment or like a cluster, which is the basically more or less fixed in size, but would provide you with uh, Spark, Hive, and different combinations. So you can basically put together your cluster and deploy it um, pretty quickly. And just because, of course, this is a data science meetup, I just uh, want to spend half a minute or so to also show you this. So basically, this is the um, machine learning platform from, that you will get uh, within CDP. And um, if we drill down here a little bit, uh, you will see a lot of different um, tabs on the left side, hopefully. It might also be that the environment is already down because it's, uh, nope, it's there. So um, basically the takeaway here would be that you have um, sessions, which is uh, like a Jupyter notebook or any other engine that you would run your uh, code into or develop. Uh, you can deploy models, you can uh, run experiments, I don't have anything here yet, uh, but uh, Basically, in you know, the experience, if you know, um, uh, if you have run an experiment with your model and you want to retrain it and see how it proves, that's what you would get there. Um, and I really want to just quickly give you an impression on how this would look like. You can also deploy the applications afterwards as its own service, and you have all of this inside the single um, service uh, data service here, which is here. And just to come back very quickly to this uh, software as a service, or in general, if you're interested in more, um, please register for Cloudera Now, which is an event uh, where they can go into much more detail than I can go now, um, and which will be also here in, in Vienna on 25th. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And also, uh, Florian took uh, that's um, <laughs> I just I just uh, don't know the English name. Oh yeah, it's just uh, sorry. That's um, some small giveaway at the end of the, of the talks. So we'll give away uh, one speaker, which is branded by Claudia, of course, uh, to some lucky guy or guys or both, right? Yeah, some lucky guy here. Um, <laughs> to take <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, so it's a speaker. Uh, register. Okay. So, uh, thank you. And then uh, our next speaker on stage is Heinz from uh, Magenta, uh, who will tell a few words about Magenta and the mission. Hi, everybody. Hi. My name is Heinz. Um, my responsibility is to tell you that uh, you can also win the speaker if you're a girl. <laughs> no, just kidding. I, I don't have any slides prepared. Um, so I'm responsible for the data science team here at Magenta, and I was asked today to give you, um, to tell you a few words about basically data science at Magenta. Uh, later on, we're also going to have to talk on how to score a job as a data scientist. I'm assuming that some of you might also be looking for a job as a data scientist. So let me advertise some of the positions that we have at the moment. So indeed, as of today, we have a new job posting out for a data scientist slash ML engineer. And also in our big data team, we have a big data automation engineer job posting out at the moment. So if you're interested, feel free to either approach me, approach Georg in the back there, or we also have Angela from HR here, if you have any questions. So what do we do here at Magenta in terms of data science? Um, on the one hand, of course, we have the classical uh, B2C machine learning use cases such as uh, germ prediction or tariff recommendations for cross and upselling. Uh, we also mostly work with structured data in this regard. Then for customer service, we have a whole host of use cases which are about proactively informing customers, for example, in case of uh, technical outages. But also in the technical domain, we have stuff like proactive network maintenance. And uh, one focus topic for us in the future, because I mentioned we have the data science, uh, data scientist ML engineer position out. Um, it's also going to be ML engineering and MLOps, of course. So things like monitoring models over time, automated retraining, 
making sure the models will perform as they should perform. So this is going to be an important focus topic for us in the next years. So if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out. We are here. And that being said, thanks for coming. Hope you're going to enjoy the talks. And yeah, I'm going to give the word to Mario. Yeah. also from the Vienna Data Science Group. Uh, I see some faces that I know from the Data Science Cafe that I used to host almost four years ago. And we are restarting the Data Science Cafe. I'm going to be the host per se again. But we have two twists, basically. Our first Data Science Cafe is going to be on the 6th of October, two and a half weeks. And we celebrate uh, starting at 5 p.m. We have mentors this time, okay? I'm going to be mentor in one specific area, and the others that you might know from the community are going to be also mentoring. If you want to see exactly what are the mentor areas that they are going to take care, just go to the invitation that is in our meetup. It's really clear what is everybody uh, covering. And we have a special session that is Data Challenge that is called Data for Autism, okay? Basically, I will bring some ideas that are not implemented, but I know how it could be implemented. Uh, specifically for challenges, is not, the idea is not to cover everything in one session. Remember that the Data Science Cafe used to be a regular event, and we are going to retake it, the regularity, four or six weeks, show my mind. But basically, we are going to do it frequently. And the Data uh, for Autism are data challenge with domain expertise, and also with a good idea or how it could be implemented. But nonetheless, it still needs a lot of hours of coding, okay? So if you want to challenge yourself, you could take one of these. And the Data Science Cafe, you might not know, but basically it's a really fussy event, but it's a really social event, talking about our favorite topics and so on, okay? So having said that, let's go directly to the topic. Basically, it's a pleasure to be here today as a speaker. Uh, I have been collaborating with Pavi since 2015, two years before starting the Data Science Cafe. I was already involved with Pavi. And today I'm presenting Time Series Forecasting with Deep Learning, joined with Karin Ludeña and Leonardo Toglia. That, uh, Karin is from Bogota in the Zoom, and Leonardo from Caracas. Okay? I'm from Venezuela, so basically they two are also Venezuela, and they are basically connected online. Sorry, the screen share, uh, for gotcha. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Good point. Uh, we also have Leslie and Carlos, but you will see. Okay? Uh, we just... Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, very important. Uh, since this is something that I have worked a lot from seven years, that it has a lot of details and so on, Believe me, I could talk more than wolf, if that is possible, and yes, I could talk more than wolf on this topic, and if I do that, Sultan is going to kill me, okay? So, I need to really go really to the topics, but I'm going to be there after the, the whole event is done. I have my computer there, and we could go in details. And if you want after today, we could still go into the details if you like something. All right, this is not the one. Sorry mm -hmm. for interrupting. Yeah, don't worry. So, perfect, perfect, and next, perfect. Okay, as I said, I need to go really quickly, although there are plenty of details, okay? But in any case, I really need to stick to the time. So basically, context. This is a solution that is for the Mexican uh, market specifically retail market. And I want you to see the pictures more than the stats per se. You see that Mexico as area is almost as big as the DAC area and other areas. And the other is the map of Austria reflected in Mexico map, okay? Basically, it's 
Mexico DF, the District Federal, and a little bit more, okay? That gives you a good sense on how big is the, the Mexico market. Basically, Mexico has 126 million people. The inflation rate is 8.6. To be honest, that's, for me as a Venezuelan, it's a little too few, okay? I am accustomed to 40 or even more. But in any case, we know how to handle inflation. It's quite off normal in Latin America. And the retail market size is 80 billion, okay, dollars. Uh, just the city of Mexico is 9.2 people. That means uh, the whole population of Austria is just in the city center per se. If you extend it, what is called the DF, that is the metropolitan area, is 21.8 million people. That gives you a good sense of how big and how complex is really the whole market, retail market in Mexico. The team, basically the founders of the, of the company are Francisco Alonso and Leslie Alonso. It's not a coincidence that they have the same uh, last name since Francisco is the dad of Leslie. And that is really relevant because basically Francisco is a domain knowledge expert. He commercialized cheese in the retail market. And since he wanted to have insights for him in 2008, he started Fabis with Leslie and then they eventually start expanding the whole team. They are Mexicans, Francisco and Leslie. The other four, we are from Venezuela, okay? Carlos live in Mexico. I have uh, always worked from Austria with them. Karin live in Bogota and Leonardo still live in Caracas, okay? So for us, working remotely is was kind of our setup always, even before Corona. This slide is super interesting. I need to go super quickly, okay? If you want to go into details, I'm going to be available today and later on. But basically, what I want to illustrate in this is that the retail per se, the retail business has a lot of data and it's a really tricky balance on how you manage the whole retail business. Who are aware of the Porter Forces, the five Porter Forces? Who know what is Porter Forces? May I see the hands? One hand over there, two, three. Okay. It's always good to have an MBA in your <laughs> data science team, okay? I'm an MBA. The Porter Forces is kind of this analysis that you see who has more power in, regarding a business. There are five, and I'm just illustrating two. There are the supplier power and the buyer power. And especially in the retail, it's super important because, believe me, when you have Walmart in one side and Henkel or Procter in the other side, it's kind of, an interesting dynamic, okay? When you are Walmart in one side, and in, on the other side you are Queso San Jacinto, what is the case of Francisco, then you have kind of a different balance of power, okay? And all these are reflected in different KPIs that are super important to manage your business, okay? Believe me, if you are not going into the details of these KPIs day by day in your retail business, you are literally out of the business because you run out of cash flow, okay? So all these KPIs somehow could be managed, it's like the mm -hmm. brand awareness and market share, all the rest could be, uh, we work it in public retail, okay? And something very important over the shelf decisions, a lot of the buying decisions are made exactly when you are directly there or nowadays when you are buying online, okay? But it's super important that you could create brand awareness and so on, but the availability of the product it's super important that you really get your product into the hands of your consumers, okay? Pavis, let's talk a little bit about Pavis. To be honest, Pavis, from a data science perspective, is a dream come true, okay? Of course, I have worked with them seven years. I have had a lot of fun with them, but why I say that it's a dream come true? First, it was designed, the whole data model, coming from a business domain knowledge, meaning the data per se is really well uh, designed to fulfill business needs. And the second reason why it's so interesting is that green, that the data quality orchestrator. Sometimes Leo, Karina and I were like, well, we say yes, just because it's published. We know that the data quality is there. This 80% of time that normally takes a lot for us is like, no, that's, they take care. 
We don't need to focus on that. Let's go to modeling, let's go to play, let's see what we could do, okay? So, of course, from our perspective, it's a dream come true because we could really play a lot with the big data that are over there. Basically, these are some numbers. Um, Pavis, per se, could connect different files. There are the retail data sources, normally portals. Walmart has a portal that provides all the information to the, uh, their providers, okay? Uh, but we could also integrate text, uh, CSV, Excel, Excel, and so on. There, is, there are ETLs that normalize the data, that take care of the data quality, and then everything is consolidated and reached through these user category, uh, catalogs. So top, that's why you have the heart, because the catalog, it helps to enrich, basically is metadata that you could put to your stores and to your products, which is super interesting when you want to do analysis, <coughs> okay? And then we provide a um, user interface that is basically a visual interface that normally is called Pavis Connect, but it, the visual interface is just one of the options of what you could do with this data, okay? What is important is the whole process is really standardized, the data quality is already there, and the whole data model was built coming from a domain knowledge perspective, which makes it really interesting as a solution. Basically, 2008 is when they start Pavis. 2015, they realized that Pavis is interesting not just for small companies and medium companies, <coughs> also for big companies, and that's why they moved to Vertica and start hosting Vertica in AWS. And uh, they, we have keep exploring and doing solutions based on the data that is there since 2015. When I say we, is Karin, which is the data scientist lead, and the team that has been with her, mainly here. And some big customers are Henkel and Bacardi, that has their data over there. I just choose this because more, most probably you recognize these brands, but there are considerably more customers from really small customers to big customers, and all could profit from this architecture. Then, very shortly, obviously when you have that, you could have a whole portfolio, especially Shelfie is right now focused on natural language processing and seeing your brand online, super interesting. I'm not going to go into the details, just that this allows you. And I'm, we are doing tests basically because I'm going to bring the lean retail analytics using the Pavis model for the Austrian market if you want to give it a try, okay? Uh, now, I want to focus on forecast, what we can, okay? When we started to explore the Pavis forecast, what is what we uh, developed using deep learning, our first thing were, okay, perfect, but how our users are going to use it? And we went to an analysis, especially we use this lean inception, that is the part that I'm going to mentor in the data science cafe, okay, if you want to go into that methodology. And in any case, we learn a lot and what are the possible scenarios of usage of forecast, okay? One is basically the supply change. Basically, I'm the person that is negotiating with Walmart, or in this case, the equivalent to Revit, and I need to fulfill a pusher sort, okay? So I need to know how much I pretend to sell of my products in each store and so on. Then I have a production plan. Remember that these are physical stuff. We are so accustomed to software that basically if we want to do something, we could buy a lot of coffee, spend three days without sleeping, and have something concrete that is not possible in retail. In retail, you really need to plan, you really need to have in advance what are you expecting. And normally, you could be uh, planning the production three, in three months in advance, okay? But when you plan, right now, because you need to buy all the stuff, that is what is called the Enterprise Resource Planning, the ERP, okay? And it's where you could prepare for what you are pretending to sell in three months time. Then you have the business management. This business management is a little bit more open, but uh, there is inflation, there is this, there is that, and you need to do a lot of business decisions to keep you with the right cash flow, okay? Normally you tend to see six to 12 months. And then you have the strategic planning, that you have a considerably more room to do in decision making, but then you are kind of seeing where I want to go. 
which kind of products I want to launch, what I want to do. But they still use forecast. It's just that the forecast is a slightly different and of the supply chain that has an immediate necessity, okay? So everybody is doing decisions today, but the scope of what they are seeing and how you are forecasting per se is different, okay? And the time frame per se is different. Then, and basically here, you have the sales or camps are the users of the pushers order, the CXOs are the ones that are the users for the strategic planning. When you have approaches for the forecast, there are two types of approaches, more or less, when you are talking about retail, okay? One is bottom-up, and the other is top-down, okay? We use this one in Pavis, the SKU store level. I'm going to explain shortly why, but basically, uh, you could also go category level and then use ratios to distribute to the SKU store levels. Uh, both has pro and cons, okay? This, you could go really granularity, but at the same time, you could be adding errors when you go top. In our case, it proved to work pretty nicely, okay? So in our case, it's working when you add in uh, from bottom up, it's still working really nicely, the errors per se. When you go top down, you have a forecast that is more at the category level, but when you need to go to the ratios, you have a risk of make it fit and believe me, I used to work at Microsoft, and when you go to the budget detail, you go to the granularity detail, and you could have a lot of things, because someone is going to be measured at this level of granularity, and so this one is preferable as soon as you manage the errors per se, okay? That's why we do this. Also, this requires more computational resources, but in our case, we find a way to really make it happen. So basically, what we are doing, we are using deep learning forecasting, okay? Uh, we did a lot of research per se, and uh, Karin, which is the data scientist lead, bring this deep AR uh, for making it happen. We are using Gluon TS, that basically is a Python library that is implemented, that we, you, we basically have a Jupyter notebook in a WS where we run this. I will show you uh, the next slide the architecture that we have in a WS, okay? But basically, it's doing literally deep learning. What is going on? I will try to see over here, okay? Sorry that my hand is not helping me here. But imagine that you have for each <coughs> SKU a store combination, okay? That means for each filial of Villa, and let's take one product. Uh, I will say the milk, no, that is a uh, low in fat, okay? You will have a time series for each filial and each SKU that ended with millions of combinations, okay? And each one is a time series. But these time series are somehow related between them. Might be, okay? Because if you have cannibalization, which is something pretty important in retail, they are going to be related but it's really difficult to get information when you have such level of granularity. And deep learning is exactly good for this kind of black boxes um, algorithms where you don't know exactly why it's happening, but you know that the result makes sense. And it's exactly what happens here. We have, in, I just put here three different time series, but imagine these 18, billion, 18 millions of combinations that are working this, okay? And you could have what we call categorical variables, okay? What is a categorical variable? A categorical variable, for example, I mentioned that there is inflation, and the inflation rate will affect all products. That is a categorical value, okay? That you could have zero, one, or you could have specific things. So basically, this X correspond to the categorical values. The others are basically the point in time of this huge matrix that are doing the deep learning, okay? We didn't develop, per se, the Gluon TS that is available, and there are very nice documentation on this regard. What we did is that we train our models using this, and we create a robust infrastructure that makes sense out of these techniques that are there. Something really important in this deep learning, and especially when we are using deep AR, is that you don't become just one number. You become, indeed, a distribution, okay? 
basically until here, it's a reality, and until here you have a distribution where you have obviously different percentiles that is moving. But there it was super interesting because of course from the data science motor we are receiving basically a distribution, okay? Um, 100 replicas for each forecast time, for each combination of product and store. But then the business needs just one number because I couldn't go to Walmart. Ah, yeah, I'm going to sell between two and 10 different pieces. So please put in your culture order two, between two and 10. No, they want a number. So in this case, what we did is basically to give the chance to configure which percentile you want to play. Because indeed, there were some products and some categories when you have over inventory, it's risky. Imagine if you are selling fish, you don't want to have over inventory, so it's better that you are a little bit out of the stock. But if you are selling something that you could have a storage, maybe you want to play the other way around. So we are allowed to choose in which percentile you are moving, because in the end, the business need, especially for the case of retail, uh, change the first uh, four to eight weeks uh, scenario, you need just one number. But our model allows us a whole distribution, okay? And this is the kind of things why combining the different expertise are super important when you're implementing these kind of things. Finally, before the demo, and as I told you, there are plenty of details that I'm happy to discuss, but please, uh, you could ask me some things I, in the Q&A, but there were the other, you could come to me and we discuss the details. Before the demo, I just want to show you the architecture, okay? Uh, one of the things that we learned all this time working on this kind of data is the importance of having a really robust platform. Because nowadays, the, da the data is not that different, but the usage of the data has changed, okay? And when you have this level of granularity, you could do a lot, but you really need to have a really robust platform. And since it's production ready, it's not just robust, it also needs to be competitive in terms of price. Especially at Amazon Web Service, it's tricky. You really need to fine tuning all, all the stuff to really have a competitive price. And that is something that Pavis has gained a lot of knowledge. So basically, our um, our big data infrastructure is in Vertica, which is the equivalent of a Hadoop, okay? Uh, I know in Europe it's not that well known, but um, it is indeed has proved to be a really good decision that Pavis did in 2015. Then we have the ETL that we use Pentaho, okay? And uh, we have the bokes of S3, like our, basically like a folder that you have in Amazon, where this ETL, ended with a CSV, a CSV with the data of the last two years and okay, we do an aggregation that is uh, weekly and this aggregation weekly we do it at the level of SKU and store. So we end with a CSV with all these details. Here we have, this is a queue manager, okay? This is a, a saying, hey, a new CSV come, start the whole process and this lambda is a serverless function, okay? Meaning we don't need to have a dedicated infrastructure that is really expensive to run this stuff. Because the Lambda say, hey, something happened, go serverless, start running all that we have in Python, okay? That is in the in Amazon SageMaker and the step functions. And there are several steps that we did in this Python. That was the main job of Leonardo, okay? And I think he's connected in any case, if you want to go to something really concrete, but we are using the S3 as our data lake in the meantime. Since there are several steps, we go, we store, we recap, and so on, until we finish with our prediction, okay? This prediction that is coming from the UNTS goes again to Pentaho, the ADL is stored in special um, tables in Vertica, and then this goes to Tableau. But this Tableau is a Tableau server. You are going to see it immediately because it's the, basically the demo that I have for you, okay? And in this Tableau is where we create the graphical uh, input that people could analyze what we are doing from the forecasting 
process behind. Okay? Having said that, basically, I'm going to the demo. Please help me with the video. And then I will be open. The, the demo is a video that I pre-recorded to be sure that it's uh, then you will see that it's in Spanish because obviously the platform for Mexico is in Spanish, but I translate the meaning, okay? Uh, and I point now to the most important things, and we could see the demo live after the talk if you want to see it that way, okay? So, just play. I'm editing. We are going to do right now the demo of the Paris podcast. But basically, we have a visual interface in our Paris Connect, but one of the models is related with Orcas, okay? I'm going to start, obviously, with for a Mexican market, so the whole interface is in Spanish, and I want to start here with this, that is basically the versions of Paris Orcas. As you can see, the basic one is the one that is active, as you see, the beta version, and in our roadmap is going the plus and the pro. Basically, here in the basic, I will translate this that is in Spanish. Uh, right now, we are allowed to have 14 weeks of forecast. Uh, we have two definitions of forecast base forecast and the final forecast. Okay, I will uh, explain that when we go to the forecast plus. Then we compare sales versus the base forecast, and we also do the inventory distribution that I'm going to show you in a few minutes uh, in detail. Then we have uh, in the Roma, in the following weeks, there will be the Forecast Plus and the Forecast Pro. Basically, the Forecast Plus, on top of this, is allows you to do the construction of the final demand, which means you could document the business decision making and you could use the a base forecast as to what the system is suggesting to do, but then you could modify and add any decision making that is done by the, by the business. You could document the reasons why you are deciding to increase or decrease the forecast per se, and based on that, we will uh, recommend a better distribution of the inventory in the final source. This is especially important if you are predicting that you will have a higher demand, but you are not able, for example, to produce the level of um, quantity for that final demand, you might need to make some decisions on how you distribute these products across the whole change, retail change, and uh, uh, the forecast plus option will help you to okay, where is better that you send more product, okay? Uh, and finally, the Forecast Pro, it uh, allows you to have to almost one, basically one year of forecast. It allows you to have price elasticity from a data science perspective. Uh, basically, this is a very specialized analysis that's quite interesting and goes uh, to if the demand will be affected by the prices per se. And we also have kind of a suggestion on how it should be ordered based on the final forecast. Now I'm going to focus on the two views that we have for the final, for the forecast basic that is implemented. So the first thing is that we have a set of different filters. All these filters that you are seeing here are coming from the catalogs, from the catalogs of the stores and from the catalog of products. The first uh, interaction that we have is basically that we have a trend per se of how it has been and the growth here today, uh, the last two weeks, the last eight weeks and so on, and these two go basically by, uh, using the forecast how it's predicting. We see that uh, the last week is this one, the week 36, and how is the forecast seen for the next 14 weeks, okay? And I could see more details of the fill rate, the evolutions, and prices. I could also see it by change, okay? And with this by change, 
a retail chain, I could see the forecast in detail to see how it's going, for example, in Walmart, what's for her, and what is the prediction of growth on this forecast. Uh, I will also have the chance to see weekly KPIs for each change, knowing what is the growth, what is the forecast of pieces that you would have, what is the error of the forecast, which basically uh, measured through the map, uh, the prices and the level of inventory last year and current year. Um, coming back to our main uh, display we have here, last year, this year, but and forecast, if we go this uh, direction, we will see that around the week uh, 36, these are adverse, and here they start to be basically based on forecast. Of course, last year is uh, uh, final data, but the forecast is giving me a better approach for how it's going to work. And here, finally, we have uh, the map for uh, the or the error of the forecast per product. We normally have the most sell product uh, at the top and then go. It depends on which, uh, which week you start and which week you end. We also have here um, an elasticity analysis, but this elasticity is not based on data science per se. It's more based on a comparison between sales and price. And the sales and price is also based on quantity of pieces and how much money I sell. Or I could compare here with uh, uh, average price, inventory, and how many stores has the availability of my products. Okay? Finally, we have here an interesting, um, an interesting analytics where I could compare two products, how they compare with each other. I just choose, and I could see if they are behaving similarly, or one is in the sense of a, the other one. Okay? So coming back here, come back. This is the first uh, view where we have the chance to explore all related with uh, the forecast of states. But there is a second dashboard that is really important. That is this analysis the inventory, and it's basically an inventory analysis. Okay, how it works. Remember that it's not just how much I'm going to sell. It's also how is it distributed, okay? Remember that Mexico is a really big country and it needs to the East percent to this uh, to do the dispersion of the inventory is quite tricky. So uh, normally we talk a lot about days of inventory, okay? And these days of inventory is basically uh, that is these <coughs> days on hand and days on two to is tuberia, which is pipeline. Is uh, in English, and basically these two indicators that we are talking here are the measures of how many days of inventory I have. But these days of inventory require somehow that I know how much I have to sell or how much I do pretend to sell, okay? Because it's part of the equation. So it's last week's, uh, last four weeks, it gives me an average that normally is the base for. Uh, most of the days of inventory, but it also I could use the forecast because in this case is less than what I used the last used the last four weeks or the forecast in three weeks, uh, and this will give me a different uh, overview on how much is out of the stock, how much is almost out of the stock, what is healthy, and what is has uh, over inventory. This new nueva. It's the you know new ones and it's, it doesn't have sales because it's a new store and I could not do any kind of calculations of uh, days of inventory because I don't have the basis to do it and that's why it's classified this way. So basically, we could explore the, in the different basis uh, the average sales of the last four weeks, the forecast of next week, and the forecast in three weeks versus. Two. In this case, it's the forecast of the next three weeks versus the pipeline, which means what I already have on hand and what is in, on its way to the store per se. 
um, very important. Uh, if I go here, I will see that I have a cluster of the stores. These clusters, it's fine, but the stores have a lot. And this alcance is basically the scope. Let me know that I, I am covering this store when I'm selling my products. Because it could be that the store exists, but this and you are not selling in this specific filial. And that is uh, what it gives me. Very important, it gives me already the numbers that we have of this version of inventory, the number of combinations by uh, store and scandal that are healthy or uh, out of stock and so on. And this part it allows me to see the numbers uh, in terms of number of pieces that I have sell. Then I could go and see the same analysis by a store and how is this reported and so on. Uh, coming back over here, I could see how much is in stock per se. Um, this in stock, it will give me a very good idea on how is the, my stock in the next day, the next three days, and the next seven days, and how much of my combinations are somehow covered by each of the um, change that are per se. And then I could go and see by product how much it's covered uh, in each of the videos. Coming back, I could do more or less the same, but what is agotados, that is the, the, the Spanish word for out of the stock. In this case, I could pick how much combination, number of SKU and stores are out of the stock, how much I'm losing, and this says dollar, but in this case it's Mexican dollars, okay? And it will give me a good idea in which change I'm having this problem. Uh, since this is a blog, it's really interactive, and in this case, for example, I did the Pareto super quickly to see that the product that has more uh, out of the stock and I need to take some actions is a Sadero and so on. So, as you could see, it's a, an interesting way because I allow the user to explore through a lot of filters that they define in their catalogs and they could gain a rich analysis of the business just reviewing what we are proposing as a forecast with the learning model that I have already said. Thanks for your attention. Well, that was the basically the demo where you see what is the business user seeing. Of course, behind there is a lot that is going on. I already explained it. I just forgot to mention something, okay? That is basically, this is an anatomic model of a brain, okay? And normally, uh, what you have when you are helping with deep learning or so on is this part, what is the executive function or what is called logic, okay? But the humans has emotions, okay? that is mainly this part, okay? All this part is emotional brain and these one are more connected to the body for the movement and so on. When we are doing a process of forecast on business, we never should forget that business has a lot of decision making and Although we could provide this level of detail of forecast, business could decide something concrete that makes change on what is the trend, okay? And this is basically the motions. It's basically what I want to do, which kind of products I want to introduce, or I, uh, I want to discontinue this. So I might have a lot of sales in the past of one concrete uh, uh, product that then is out. Why? Because it's my decision. And that is the one that I, when I was explaining the pros and the pro, we built the whole infrastructure to accept also the documentation of this human decision making, okay? Where we see the product as a support of the human decision making, not a replacement, okay? The, uh, we had it implemented completely, not because the model is not, doesn't have it, indeed it's already there at back end, what is tricky is which UX you provide that the humans could document in a reasonable way the, what they are deciding, okay? And that is exactly what is going on right now, the UX part. But the whole, uh, since the day one, we define the whole model to provide, obviously, the deep learning algorithms, all this part that goes into the logic part, but also enable and empower the business to do their decisions because there are things that uh, although we could have categorical data, we could provide considerably more information also to the algorithms, and the algorithms support it, 
there are still certain things that are exactly what makes us human and what makes us possible to change the future, okay? And when we are forecasting, we are working on the future. And that is the point of always include in your solutions also the human part. We did it since the day one and we kind of enable and empower the business to do this way, okay? Uh, if you want to, I'm going to accept as much as questions as Sultan allow me, okay? And the rest, um, I have a, could you put the presentation in? Uh, this Friday, I have a, a room uh, in the collab where I have my, okay? Basically, if you want, I have the beer game, okay? It's uh, for understanding written. It's a, a game that you normally do in the NBA. It's really funny. And if you want to come, I have the, in my LinkedIn, the event. And it's going to be this Friday in Amtower 36 from 10 to 12 if you want to go more into how it works, the retail and the complexity out of it, okay? This beer game is, as I said, an, uh, a game that we play in the NBA. And if you are interested in, in retail, it could be super Very not that. I'm done. You I suggest that we defer the questions to after the talks because we are somewhat behind schedule okay. and it's quite hot. It's getting quite hot here. So uh, I'm going to yeah. be here with my laptop after the talks. You could come and we go into details if you are interested in that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right. So our next speaker is Jan Baran and he's going to talk about how to land a deal job in a big company. So let me set you up, yeah? Okay, so I'm with, uh, let me know if you can not hear me or something. So I'm really happy to be here because this used to be my home for many years. So nice memories, so thank you very much, Georg. And I spent the whole day fighting in Cloudera, so I was also happy to see that they do some uh, promise service. So I would like to spend so much time with the platform and we can focus on something better. And I get also an idea from Ari, so next time I'll record the video and I will not have to be stressed in front of it. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, so I'm Jan, and yeah, I'm a corporate bitch. So I work for big corporates, I started working for a startup, but then it was acquired, and I'm happy with it. So I think I had my first data scientist like 10 years ago. It was difficult, we didn't know how to do it, where to find them and I'm still hiring a data scientist, and it's still difficult, different, but I still don't know if I'm doing something wrong. I don't know if you'll manage to I don't know, answer my questions now, but I will definitely put some questions so the people here in front of could be scared because, yeah, I will ask some stuff. But, yeah, let's start with it. So, when I think about corporate, it's really something huge, yeah? So, I got here a list of the, let's say, IT consulting companies, the big corporates in Europe, we have yeah, the American and Indian one, which is also present in the Austrian market. And yeah, so for just to compare. So I will just want to show you one, which I work for. And if we are not looking for, yeah, I hope you know the names, yeah? But Accenture is European because they probably the tax reasons, they uh, move to the Dublin because they don't want to pay taxes. But the rest, if you of course, he exclude the, after the Brexit, the London one, is the first and biggest one in the top Germany. <coughs> and uh, of course, um, I don't know too much marketing, but I just wanted to point out that if you want to work for the European company, Deutsche Telekom will be also great because I'm proud that I'm working for a European company. Not everything coming from America is the best, yeah? So, um, maybe just to give you a point how big it is. So I think the Deutsche Telekom would have some 200,000 people, yeah? Big cloud there, yeah, not so much. We have really now over 300,000 people. So if you think about Google, yeah, it sounds cool, but it's half the size. So Google has 100 people, yeah. Facebook, yeah, 30,000 maybe. With Amazon, we cannot compare because I think Amazon is over 1 million, but they not do really all of them with something with IT. And by the way, if you got some questions, please just ask me, interrupt me. I'm really happy to get the feedback. So you will expand my social bubble and maybe I will get some other one. So, how it is running? Some, yeah, I hacked our HR system and extract some data. 
So I will also present you some results which are, let's say, something more concrete than only my opinion. Because of the PGDPR and so on, I was able to get the data from last two years, and I found that we got like thousand or one thousand CVs for data scientists. We managed to get hundred of them to do get an interview with us, and we hired only twenty five of them. So, when I take a look on this like this, I would say that the people just cannot write a good CV because most of the CVs were rejected, yeah? or they submit blow up with the interview. It also could be a reason yeah? why we don't have it. Any question here? Uh, well, since we have such a good, nice uh, AI model, I think we would write uh, AI-generated CVs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the pictures mm -hmm. immediately. That was my last slide. I will not spoil the results. Yeah, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will tell you how that went off. Yeah. So I think we will just focus on it. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I was expecting a bit more people here, maybe younger. Let's say maybe some students, which <laughs> looking for the first job. I will get some special slide for it. But yeah, if I will be too stupid. Uh, you have no idea what people are doing during the interview process, so yeah, let's see. Uh, I hope you will have fun, um, something like stand-up comedy, so if you feel to laugh, just laugh, no problem. So, starting the CV. Yeah, so my first really like big point is, please let somebody else read your CV before you send it somewhere. Like, I don't know if the guys from the Club Dera will hire somebody who cannot write Club Dera properly in their CV or I don't know if you work with some Python library every day and you cannot spell it properly. You write really, I am expert with MongoDB, and you are writing something really bottom of MongoDB. That whole your CV just somehow, yeah, got some holes in it, yeah? So just please ask a friend, ask somebody here. Really, that's still a lot of people out there which are doing such as, let's say, beginner mistakes, yeah? And keep it short, yeah, that's good. So I will ask somebody from the first row, so what do you think? Ideal length of the CV is one pages, two pages, ten pages, hundred pages. What is the ideal? Somebody, get one any page. opinion? One page. If it's data science, so it should be several pages because yeah. it should be some uh, words. Yeah, yeah. So I think there will be some exceptions, but really, I take a look, and the most CVs we got and we hired has one or two pages. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, if you are really super senior data scientist and you get lots of uh, publications, yeah, it get longer. But keep it short. What do you think? How was the longest CV I received? Twelve pages. Thirty. Yeah, twelve pages. Okay. Um, didn't get the job. Um, why so? Yeah, so you so saw if you get like one thousand of CVs, maybe I should yeah, tell you some about the process. Yeah, of course the HR got the CV, do some first checks. I don't know if it's not spam, blah blah blah. But we we did take a look to everyone, to really every CV. If there is really some talent, which maybe HR will ignore it, but really, <coughs> I saw, I think, all of this one of my CVs. So how much time do you think I spend on the CV? Two minutes? Less than five minutes. So if it is really good CV, then yeah, more. But if it is bad, I think I got my train. I, yeah, in one minute, maybe I am really able to say it is not good. So it has to be really Focus and a, a catching, yeah. yeah. So think about it also from my side. I don't want to sound like an asshole, but yeah, that's yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, simple design. I don't know, do you all know this Europass? I think yeah. Yeah. at least some money we are paying to European Union, they use good, and we got really these nice templates. Uh, we don't have all of them coming in this pass, especially for the guys I don't know from the uh, different continents which are applying for us, but. It's really the good starting point. Mm, yeah, if not, you don't want to use it, at least get inspired structure and so on and use it in, you know. So, yeah, if you are not really, let's say, don't have these artistic feelings, do it like this, you cannot do any wrong. Uh, it's nice touch. So if you, for example, adjust your CV for specific post posting you are doing, so if you know that there is just posting that you want to have cloud experience, that you maybe mark cloud work really, with the nice color, so it is really eye catching. I think I don't like it when I see, I don't know, Python and Excel to each other because yeah, it's just not the same thing. No. So make it really attractive. Uh, photo. 
it's nice. So I like to have a photo there because sometimes, especially now when we are going to <coughs> interviews online, I am surprised that I'm expecting men and a woman is coming to the interview because of the exotic name, I don't know them, all of them. Yeah, these mistakes happen very often to me. So question, do you like putting photos there or not? No. Yes, who likes to put photos in the CV? Not sure, yes. Not so much. Yeah. It's still really getting personal feelings then you see, okay, okay, there is somebody there on the other side, it's not a planned CV, it's a little bit difficult to reject if you see there is some like, kind of nice person there. <laughs> uh, but if you are putting it, make sure it's really professional, don't put too much Photoshop. So here I see some really photo which lots of filter which I don't recognize what is there on the other side, it also doesn't help very much. So keep it professional. Uh, maybe... So, I did also some data science in the CVs we got. So, what do you think? Which color is most popular for CVs? Blue. 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 Some other opinion? Black. Black, Black is not a color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's blue. I was really surprised. I don't know if it's because of this template, but it's blue. And the people which we hired has really more of them has blue elements in the CV than blank black. So, yeah, no explanation. Blue is the color. If you want to do it, then use the blue color. Which format? What do you think? Which format is ideal for CV? Excel? Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Jason? Languages. That's a little tricky. So I think on our, uh, our job postings, we are asking specifically that you should write us in, in uh, English. But I think it doesn't hurt if you will get your CV in two languages, like German and in English. I remember when I was looking for first job in Austria, I think with the English CVs I didn't score, with the German CV I scored much more. <laughs> so, yeah, good point. Yeah, so the stuff which are here, really, I think, this, when we get telephone number there is cool because we can contact you if I don't know we are not responding, want to know if you are not on holiday or whatever happened with you. Address is also fine because at least we can start discussion about I don't know where you live, if you would like to relocate to Vienna or whatever. So that stuff it's it's good if you will follow it. Yeah. A couple of more. LinkedIn. <laughs> so people are including LinkedIn URL to the CVs. And do you do it? I do it. Do you have LinkedIn? Yeah. Who has yeah. LinkedIn? Yeah. Still not so much. Um, no. From time to time people put some other social media links in their CV. Do you do it? In which? Twitter. Okay. GitHub. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube channels some people put there. Yeah. yeah. Twitters. It helps. <laughs> it definitely helps. And uh, yeah, LinkedIn, for example, if I click on the link and I see that I'm to get or connect with you, I can ask you for reference. It's really helpful if I got some good reference about you. Yeah? So, Xing is really mm -hmm. <laughs> small local. <laughs> Git, on the other hand, Git is cool, but only if there is something there. So, there are people putting like, really, oh, I'm so proud, this is my Git repository, and you take a look. They clone, I don't know, some cloud data stuff, but and they that, put one commit there. That's it. That, that, that problem is you work for a company and they have, a, you know, their own repositories, not public GitHub. Yeah, then of course you cannot put it there. But if you want to put there, then make sense that it makes sense because, yeah, I am happy that I can take a look. Yeah, I don't know what, yeah, if you put commit messages <coughs> in your and so on and see your Python script if it is really that has a proper formatting and so on, if it is really easy to read bar, at least give me some idea what the person is doing, but only if you get her something, because if it is empty, then it's really, you know, finally, you know, so, yeah. Well, what about if you don't have links in the last two, three years that you program a lot, but you are top contributor on some project? It's a, an interesting situation, I find, because it's like you're at the you know, in the middle of a career somewhere. Yeah, yeah but I think... That how would that get evaluated? That's important to I'm know. not sure how it is in the GitHub, but I think you will see in your profile some statistics about it, so... Yeah, that's what I'm seeing, like, that your past contributions were great, but now you're not 
But I'm saying, if you got that something two years ago, it's perfectly fine, I can still include it. But if it is really nothing there, or it is really yeah. one clone from, I don't know, some other repository, uh, it's not cool. So, yeah. Uh, just show something if you got something to show, and be really ask somebody for feedback if you are not sure. And the other said list of publications, so I don't know how often you publish something, maybe uh, some PhD students or sort of publication, publications, and the list could be really long. I honestly, yeah, it's nice. I'm not checking really all of this, so yeah, I will probably check one or two just to get an idea. But you don't have to spend two, three pages. Yeah. So, uh, of course, the publication should we just mention that we have article that is it without mentioning the list. So the topic, so the um, okay. So I'm stupid. So for me, maybe only the title will be enough if it I will find attractive or let's say yeah related to the work we are looking for. Then maybe I'll read the article or the publication. But as we said. Um, if I spend five minutes on your CV and I will not find what I need there, I will not read every 20 publications you have there just to get a different opinion. So, yeah, just be maybe put top three, which you are most pro proud of, and you feel which are relevant. I think that would be fine. But it, it would be important, for example, if you have a new REAPS or ICLF publication, especially as a data scientist. Yes. There are definitely companies which will be really interested in it, but let's say in a consultant business, when you really um, are focusing really on something else, to be really pragmatic and be really able to deliver projects really quick and doesn't have to be so perfect. So yeah, it's probably a different target audience. Um, yeah, what else? Ah, yeah, the famous topic. So, yeah, we're already here. So, when you, some people put already so the expectation in the CV, uh, we request this information also when you apply the apply for job for us. Why it is so? Because there's nothing really more frustrating than you got really. So you got, I know, two, three interviews with a guy, you liked him and at the end he said, I want so much that we will just not be able to pay him for it. Yeah? So, to just effort based it and it will be really, um, yeah, it's not good. So basically, you should think about it because that will be the first question which HR will ask you. And if you'll see that there is no fit there, then we will immediately reject the CV because yeah, we, cannot, we cannot do it. And this is something what you can also ask your guy, colleagues, I don't know, what you think is really reasonable. Um, um, yeah, so there is still possibility, but if there are expectations from both sides are completely not compatible, <coughs> then it makes sense to stop with it in the beginning and not to then get disappointment at the end. Yeah, especially for the guys coming from outside, it mm. is good that you get informed about. So if you're not from Austria and you're coming from different country, so there are specifics here. So of course HR can explain you this or we'll get you some document, but it's good that you will check at least Okay, how much cost the life here in Vienna? How much is the taxes here? This put on the stuff that we get 14 salaries and so on. Not to be then disappointed, you get a first salary, you get fuck. Yeah, so that's less what I was expecting because then it's a little bit too late, yeah? <coughs> so just get informal about it. Uh, yeah, and in consultancy, that is really, I don't know if you are aware of it, but in consultancy, there's very often some kind of like motivation schemes, some bonus, so you will not get full salary, but you will, for example, get only 90% or 80%, depends, and the rest will be then bounded on your performance. So it could be something like, I don't know, how could you manage your projects, if you did your certification, which you got it as a touch, and you can get more or you can get less. So also you should consider this, that's something really what is in consultancy very often, so that's also, you should also take this into consideration. Yeah, so. Many companies, they also have a stock plan, it's nice, you will get this information if you're interested, it's also cool. Yeah, in the job postings you very often see, you now this collective attract, blah, 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 minimum. We have also something like this. This one is from my famous position, which I will maybe spoke later on about it, but at least you know how you should move yourself, yeah. 
Um, and I said, be realistic. So I know some guys tell me, oh, I would like to have something between 50 and 100,000. <laughs> okay, that's I don't find very, let's say, professional. I said, oh, I want to, I think, I don't know. You cannot do too much wrong with the salary expectations. So take your salary right now and put something on top, maybe. Yeah. And yeah, of course, if you will say, I want so much, then it could be excluded from the very beginning and to save a separate from the other side. Yeah. No questions? I was thinking about the salary about the most questions, but we can discuss it also later on. I have a question. Go on. Uh, in, in this uh, scenario, what would be the nice? Go to 94, 99 or 95,000? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends on you. Yeah. So if you are really like maybe a junior or senior, so you have to find yourself somewhere there. I cannot judge you. Not that yeah, the audit part is maybe, I don't know, but I will consider you senior already, so maybe you yeah. second half of it there. Okay. How long can you spend doing data science? Uh, yeah, okay, and last sentence in this uh, posting was that we are expecting that we are writing a CV in the English, that's cool. Yeah, so that's still an expectation I took from this job posting. It's my favorite job posting. I got it open for two years and I had no money. Yeah. Um, because I would say people are not reading. Yeah, so... I want a senior data scientist, and I want that they can get some data uh, manufacturing experience. Yeah, I got lots of the uh, people applying for this job. Maybe they were hired for some different position, but I still haven't found nobody for this. Yeah? Then just please read it. I could be just upset that I will see somebody applying for this position, which is absolutely not senior. But yeah, there are companies which probably made different <coughs> departments for juniors and seniors and they don't communicate to each other. If I see this one and somebody is really nice, then I can forward it to the other colleagues maybe to get some, yeah, some other chances in our company. But come on, please read it. Or I don't know. There is also the location. So I, I got really, we are a French company and I got really lots of guys that are speaking both German, speaking French and bad English. I say, what the hell they applied for Vienna then? So, if we want to the guys in French, maybe they can bigger chance there. What do you consider senior? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 that's a good question. I am really bad that for me senior is really more years <laughs> than some others. I, some project when I am, I think that they consider seniors after three years. I don't and it should be written in the title. I've, no, it's not in the title, it's in the description. So you got it then later on, maybe here, some blah, 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 five to eight years experience. Yeah. Exactly. I just got it, it's at least two pages to for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, so if you apply, what happened? Uh, you could have a, let's say, a question or a test or a challenge from us. That doesn't happen for the senior colleagues, but not for the junior one, but we have to really filter out. I found it really, let's say, I don't want to say that I want to cry, but when I see the data scientist, which I don't know, doesn't, cannot write SQL, then it could be that some of our juniors will get some SQL quiz just to see if, yeah, they can write some SQL. And if you got this, then maybe, inform the HR that you need more time, you need weekend to do it, depending how complex it is. Really don't do it in the last moment. Uh, yeah, don't do it last moment, just I wanted to excuse myself. I did my presentation in the last moment yesterday, so that's how it looks like. It looks like your CV when you would be doing it should look more professional. So spend more time on it. <coughs> and communicate very professionally. So if you need more time, because I don't know, you got too much work, you got holiday, yeah, just tell the other people, so you'll get more time. So that was about CV. Interview. So we managed, we had the interview. What can go wrong, <coughs> you know? Yeah, so being on time is really one of the most crucial things, especially when, oh yeah, yeah. Right now, everything is uh, online. I don't know, just make sure if it is Zoom call, Teams call, whatever, you got the tool installed before, not like exactly one minute before, because of course it doesn't work. So yeah get repaired, tested, and it works. The camera is set up. 
I don't know, uh, that your setups where you are, you got internet connection and so on. Um, yeah, I I know, I came, for example, very open to the interview late because I got customer meeting before and maybe it's getting delayed. So yeah, I excuse myself, but I would also maybe excuse some guys if they come two, three minutes late to the interview, but then 15, maybe some, I don't know, Spanish countries, it's a little bit less stressed, but we are here, let's say in German region, we want to really put so, so go on. I think I think the mic stopped working. Yeah? Yes. Could be. <laughs> Gerhard? I don't think we can do anything about this, so just speak up. <laughs> <laughs> but battery looks okay, so maybe I will try to speak so yeah the guys and girls in the last row had problem. Um yeah. Just don't pretend that something and you are going to be yourself. Uh, as I saw, I did hundreds of interviews, so I will be always better, or HR will be always better than you. They will find out if you are trying to play something or be somebody who is you are not. Yeah. I have a question. Go on. I have so many questions. I am very happy about yeah. it, because I have not so many slides, so I am happy for every question. Uh, should we hide the background, or background make us some decision for you to hire in person or not? No, it doesn't have to. So, but please. Yeah, make your room nice. So if I see, I don't know, Britney Spears, poster, yeah, like, yeah. good influence, Mr. No. no, I don't know. But if I will see, I don't know, I saw last time the guys, he got some I, um, Raspberry Pi project behind him. I have, we can discuss it. And I see that he's patient and yeah, it's cool. So we don't have to hide it. If you got a really mess in your room, then maybe I'll hide it. And no Jack Daniels on the side. Okay. <laughs> I like Jack Daniels. <laughs> we got some topic to discuss, so it depends. Should be really, you can put touch of the really your personal stuff there, so it's nice, nice touch. Yeah. Um, just briefly jump in, or do you have a slide um, like specifically on video um, <laughs> calls <laughs> and interviews? If not, then can I just briefly mention that? Maybe more important than the background is like seeing your face and being well lit up and not having the like um, window in the background and not seeing the face. So that's just one thing that I find really difficult oftentimes in interviews. Yeah, so you want to see you face. at least, let's say, for identity check. So if the photo is the same with the, yeah, with the CV. With, I'm doing lots of the interviews in India. They are used to the day you show me the passports, so I can really compare that they are there and so on. So, yeah, we don't push so much here. With this, but so, yeah, if we don't see you, yeah, it's not good. Also, if your connection is not good, yeah, we can close the video and continue on audio only. But uh, now we are happy that we can invite people to come really in the office because, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, you can hide lots of stuff during the telecom teleconference, but face to face, yeah, that's what you can do. That's appropriate. So, especially as I said, we are consulting business, so I'm not really nice to dress today, but you could do lots of work. So we got guys coming with you know, flip flops, shorts, jogging hose, and yeah, it's not cool. So you should show respect and get, I mean, if you don't know, maybe you can ask, maybe with the interview or HR, what's the dress code, but I'd rather do more than less, yeah? So, yeah, I think there was kind of situation when I did the interview, and the second interview was supposed to be my boss, and he said, well, it's not really okay. And there is really, like, no go. So, I'd, yeah, you think it's stupid, but that's the way it is. So. What's more important, dress code or skill set? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we later on. I'm sure we later on. Um, I think, yeah, for some companies it doesn't matter, but when you really, we will call it like body shopping over there, yeah? <laughs> Selling bodies now in the of the company. It has to be. Well, most academicians and PhDs, they don't dress up like in a suit, and the AI models which we are using today were developed by the guys who were or girls were very flip flops and coming in short. So uh, I think big companies need to, need to decide at one point what um, to do. Yes, yes. But we have our customers and we have quantity for our customers. And if I say it's somebody really weird to the customer and they said, oh my God, who you send it to us? We can really 
lots of business, for example, there. So our target from the IT side, let's say HR, from the company is not to hire people, but not to hire wrong people, because the wrong person can do us a lot of harm. Yeah, I wanted to add exactly. If you are business uh, or customer face, you really dress appropriately because it has an impact. If you are just in a research, maybe the company doesn't care. But if you are consultant and don't have any face to customer, that is really important because customers really don't care about how technical you are and how good are your, your skill sets, more on how you could present to them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why maybe the later on, I got only five minutes, so I will go to my. And something like eye contact. I don't care about this, but so many people told me. And really, if you are in an interview, maybe online, but also physical, you have to really, at least from time, please, maintain the eye contact. So, because of the other guy, I don't know what they think, but they don't feel connected with you, or they don't think it's not so difficult. Maybe you have to try it. And dry run, yeah. So I don't know if you are scared, do dry run. Also, we are doing our new hires, which are going first time for interview the customers. We do try to hire with them. So rehearsal, we test them, we stress them, just to see, just to get it feeling. So more time you do interview, the better you are. Um, yeah. Some questions um, about this point of uh, asking questions. Um, I am sometimes. <laughs> no, but sometimes you see, especially for I think companies <coughs> that are not yet. Very much in the data science business, you see job ads uh, where they write something like, "Okay, we want to do something with data, right?" That's what the job ad is, and it's really hard then to to ask questions of what is it really you want to do, right? I mean, I would love to write an email to somebody mm -hmm. who's. Now I was making so something a little bit different, but yeah, to show that we are involved. So I cannot have an idea. So I got interview with somebody, and I am expecting that he will be two, three years at our company. And he asked me no question. So, so how come he can do qualified decision if he? I'm not so perfect that I already told him everything what he needs to know. Yeah. So I'm really waiting for some question. And if the question is good, he got really points. So I remember some questions which really surprised me. And yeah, of course the people has some, as I said, plus points. That's the game. Got some more plus points and minus points because then the end the, and you then do the decision. Good, um, and maybe the, uh, so still maybe you did CV were good, interview were good, but you still not get the job. And why it's so? I think, yeah, because there are different expectations from both sides. So I will ask you maybe quickly, what do you think such a data scientist, top three skills or sets he should have? Go, 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 go on, just drop it. Programming. Oh, so I was thinking you will not hear something, but I yeah I was yeah, I steal it, but of course you have to have programming okay, skills, programming. so you have to know your stuff. Uh, if I can propose you Python R, we yeah, have absolutely no project in R. So SQL, yeah. So other stuff, all of the ah, other stuff. Uh, algorithms like yes, yes, but well, communication. At least at our problem. communication. But does it mean only verbal communication? <laughs> Also, you have to be able to present what you did, so visualization, all, to, all these libraries which can give you some nice visualization because you have to communicate outcome of your job. You could be the best scientist ever, but if you not be able to present it to somebody else, I'm sorry, and the domino how so business knowledge, that's also something what we really want, so you cannot send somebody I know without experience with retail, banking or telecommunication to a project because he will be lost there, so there will be some numbers and he will have no idea. So that's what they are looking for, that's why it's hard to find. Uh, yeah, I want to just spend, go on. Uh, could you please go there? <laughs> uh, One more? Here. Yeah, yeah, here. Uh, the time tracking and the actual, if it's data science and it's a, if it's business driven, where is delivery? Because for the data science, if you do some job, you could do this task for years, but in your case, I think it's really important to make this task in a predictive time. Why do you not add in here just to be punctual on the time or delivery time? Because it's really important for data science. 
Yeah, you're yes. right. I don't know where we put it, but maybe I'll put it in the communication or something like this. But you're right. So our projects, we are really, most of the project customers are not paying. I don't know. So that, no, they're not so many. With the delivery. Yeah. You could be a researcher in the yeah. industry as well. Okay. Yeah, that's the kind of job. So our customers, they want to have their results immediately. So they will not wait two, three years, so they can think weeks, maybe months mostly. Yeah. So, but that's your project manager is pushing you that you will deliver it as soon as possible. But mm -hmm. you are absolutely right. And I just want to spend really two, two seconds on the, because I promised it. If you are really looking for a first job as data scientist, that's very hard, I understand, mm -hmm. because you don't have so much behind you. Uh, but if you got nice Git repository, if you did some, we forgot it, yeah, if you got Kaggle profile which you can link and show us, it's perfect. If you got some certification, yeah, it's perfect because then we see that already you missed something. Uh, yeah, and then something for this. So, by it's most of the companies, there are some entry level position, for example, at us is business analyst, and that's most of the cases. So, if I got some data scientist and he or she tell me, yeah, I'm data scientist. I do some R analysis with some Excel data. Okay, it's a good beginning, but for me, it's too less for being as a data scientist. So that's why maybe we should consider a business analyst job, and level job. We will learn more programming, more business know-how. And yeah, I think we and also other companies from time to time start really some program specific for the first. Uh, job seekers when they put more people together and invest lots of time in it because it's really difficult to hire up one junior every month and then invest also much time in it. So be patient and look for this one. Your question about that if you cannot automatize everything and do ML doing hiring for us, yeah it was a fail. We tried. I think we don't have so much data. Also, during the year or during some information, some stuff, processes, changes, and people are feeling so, yeah, if I got really, if I got, I don't know, 20 wrong CVs, and then I came a little bit better CV, then I will just take it for interview because I know I got more time, uh, at least do something with it. So we haven't found any any patterns which we can use it. And we also, yeah, it will be not nice. We want to treat person as a, people as a person's personal feeling and so on. We don't want to outsource it in the, in the, the so I have a question to the previous slide. Uh, so you wrote that business analysis is a good entry position for someone who maybe does not have such a great Git repository or previous projects to show. How many years a person can work as a business analyst before it makes sense to start applying for data scientist? Is it viewed as a step up or you can work too long as a business analyst and then viewed as sort of a over specialized? That's people which are happy to be business analysts forever, yeah. mm -hmm. and they grow on this part. It, I think for the good person, it's like six to twelve months is enough for a business analyst. If they are good, yeah, and they show interest. And, and so. what kind of skills then would sort of make sense, let's say, to practice and add to your CV during that time, like a SQL, Python, that sort of a thing? Yeah, business know-how, process know-how, okay. and so on. Yeah. So there is really. Yeah, you know, so it's so bright what you can upskill yourself during the time you look at at least. And once you are in the company, then it's for you easier to jump from position to position. Yeah. The problem is to pick up inside. I will be also here, very really happy to discuss, answer your questions. I'm sorry that I long, make it longer than proposed, but I think that's, the, that's all. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Thank you for this uh, no bullshit opinion piece on uh, landing a new job. And uh, based on based on your interaction, it seems that it uh, would take another hour to answer all the questions. So Jan, you're available after the talk, right? So if uh, just find Jan out there and uh, yeah. Uh, ask for your questions. I will be sure. outside as well. And uh, as we said, I'm from, from HR, Magenta HR, so if anyone so has questions, so, yeah. So you feel should free. bundle up. And, yeah. <laughs> well, it's really <laughs> important. <laughs> on the Data Science Cafe, we have one of the mentors, Margot Mungstein. She's going, she's going to focus exactly on that mentoring people on the data science career. Okay? Mm -hmm. So just that you know, one of the mentors is focused on that. And you could have more interaction, four hours of interaction with her if you want. Okay? So it's an event already announced. 
And, and I think Mary is already full, so uh, at least there are some complaints in the Zoom chat. So, uh, you know, uh, well, you might solve it somehow. Just enroll yourself, don't worry. I have room for 70 people, more or less. It's already 72, but normally people don't know. So just enroll yourself, I will. We manage. Okay, so Mar Mari might manage it on the meetups. Uh, usually we have like between 60 and 70 percent uh, show up, so uh, no shaking legs at this moment. Yeah, go and roll yourself. We manage somehow. Don't worry. Uh, yeah. And uh, well, so just a few things and then uh, we let you go and then grab something. So about the Magenta offerings, uh, we are going to put it on the meetup, meetup site if you're interested in the offerings uh, Hank uh, talked about, so you will see it at the event page. Um, let's see what else. So, well, first of all, thanks for coming. We are going to be finished soon uh, because I know it's, you know, it's a little bit hot. Uh, but we still have a raffle, which means that we have the speaker, we also have a bottle, we have a, a cup, I believe, and a book. So, um, let's just have a quick raffle and then um, you're ready to, ready to go. So here we go, I try to do this somehow in Python. Uh, but, uh, but, but nothing serious. Uh, yeah, so you need something like, and I haven't tried that, but uh, it should work, like row is something uh, random dot random to be one to nine, I counted it. And then uh, let's come from the right. Um, this is how it is in the theaters, right? Random dot random. Because there's a bracket missing. Thanks. <laughs> One to eleven. Whoops. Scroll. Yes. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Like this. Does it work? It's like if you say yes and it has syntax error, then no way to learn the job. <laughs> Yes, okay, so, oh yeah, this is for the speaker. Uh, row 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8. Uh, once again. <laughs> and then, uh, so row 8 with the, uh, right there, Georg, with the uh, blonde girl. Yeah, right there, and then uh, the seventh person. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8. Yeah, I think it works, right? Let me know if I'm mistaken. Can you, your, can you uh, have it up? Yeah, sorry if uh, like probably you, you see it better from there. Uh, <laughs> is this Slovenian or is this one or Slovenian? <laughs> okay, in the meantime, I left Florian to help with the battle. That's row 3, right 11. I'm not sure if we have 11 people in row 3. Hey, sorry, it's overflow. It's not fair, I know. Uh, 5, 10. Hopefully that works. 1, 2, 3. Yes! That's a... Uh, yeah, that's true. That's, yeah. <laughs> Six, yeah, again. I think it's too much. Uh, yeah. No, it's empty. It's empty, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's quick enough. Seven, three. Seven, three. Uh, <laughs> okay, and now the data architecture book. Seven, seven. Wow. Yeah, it's a lucky row. <laughs> okay, folks, so remember uh, if you want to speak at the meetup, just uh, hit us up or send us a line. If you work for a company, you can host and help us with big rooms. Uh, contact us, or if you want to help in the organization of this meetup, again, contact us. Thanks for coming, and let's have a chit chat. If you want to learn more about the Data Science Cafe, it's